Hello, everyone. I'm Sandy Rosenthal with Beat the Big Guys podcast, and I'm so excited about my guest today, Ms. Carrie Gillum. Uh, let me start off by telling you a little bit about her. Investigative journalist Carrie Gillum has spent more than 25 years researching the food and agrochemical industry, spending most of her career with the international news agency Reuters. Now she has two books that reveal decades of corporate secrets and deceptive tactics by the powerful pesticide companies, including the global giant Monsanto. Carrie's 2017 book, Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science, won tons of awards, including the 2018 Rachel Carson Book Award from the Society of Environmental Journalists. That's an amazing award, among others. And in, in Carrie's words, this book is more of a textbook. And so along comes a second book released in March of this year, The Monsanto Papers, Deadly Secrets, Corporate Corruption and One Man's Search for Justice is more of a story and described by one reviewer as blending science and human tragedy with courtroom drama in the style of John Grisham. And I completely agree because I'm about halfway through. It, it, it's a page turner. Corporate powers have attempted to silence and harass Gillum. Monsanto even, I'm going to suggest I'm starting again with that one. Okay. Corporate powers have attempted to silence and harass Carrie. Monsanto even created a secret project aimed at discrediting her, according to internal corporate documents uncovered through the litigation. At this time, Carrie works as a health and environmental researcher at the nonprofit group U.S. Right to Know and a news contributor to The Guardian. Carrie, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I really think that your work as an investigative journalist has, um, will, will be a great way, if you tell your story, it will be a great way to help our listeners learn that you don't have to be uh, an, an expert uh, in, in, the in the chemical industry to beat the chemical industry, okay? You, you, it takes, it takes um, a lot of things, but you don't have to necessarily be an expert right from the start. And so in addition to uh, all of the other things that you can provide. So uh, Carrie, why don't you go ahead and just tell your story about how you stood up to one of the biggest big guys of all Monsanto. Gosh, it's a long story. <laughs> so yeah, so I've been a reporter, you know, ever since I got out of college, I always wanted to be a journalist. I always thought that there was probably no better career um, to choose, no better uh, job in the world. You know, essentially when you're a journalist, you get paid to go out in the world and learn about really interesting, important, you know, sometimes historic events and issues and things that really matter, right, to, to all of us. And then you get to tell the world about it. So I always knew I wanted to be a journalist, and I started out uh, really very early on covering corporate issues, business, and corporate America, and kind of worked my way up. Um, I was covering large bank holding companies in the 1990s when Reuters, the international news agency, asked me to move to Kansas and start covering agriculture, food, and farming. There was this company called Monsanto that had just rolled out genetically engineered crops. And these crops were, you know, unlike anything really that farmers had ever had before. You know, they had their DNA um, spliced with genes from outside the species. They were transgenic, essentially. And Monsanto had been able to alter them so that they could be sprayed directly with a weed killer, an herbicide. Monsanto owned Roundup, glyphosate-based herbicide, and they really wanted a way to encourage and increase use of Roundup. So they developed these glyphosate tolerant or Roundup ready crops. Farmers could plant them right in their fields and then they could spray directly over the crops and the crops wouldn't die, but the weeds would. And, you know, it for somebody outside of farming, maybe it doesn't sound very remarkable, but what I learned very quickly in starting to cover this industry was that it was miraculous for farmers. They loved this new invention and this new technology because it made farming a lot easier for them. And, and what course, about, about what year was this? This around? was late, the late 1990s. Okay. Um, 
And I uh, was learning everything I could, of course, about not only Monsanto, but the very other large companies that were really starting to take a dominant role in agriculture. Um, these companies were very important in uh, industrial chemicals and uh, in providing chemicals for warfare. But when we entered into this period where we weren't at war uh, with anybody, they needed new uses uh, for their chemicals. And so a lot of them started getting into agriculture. And so Monsanto and Dow and DuPont were very heavily invested. And they were, as I said, really revolutionizing and industrializing agriculture. So it was a very big and very important uh, beat for me to, to learn about and to, uh, to make sure that I understood. I was writing for people around the world through Reuters. Uh, so, you know, I dug in like you do as a journalist. And if I uh, could interrupt just for a second, did at that time, did it seem almost too good to be true? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, again, I was learning. I hadn't covered food and farming. Most of the coverage of these new GMO crops was positive. There were certainly a lot of people who were worried about them, but the companies were saying, these are gonna help us feed the world. We're also going to roll out GMO crops that are gonna yield better and taste better and grow well without water, you know, in drought situations. and. Um, you know, will require less fertilizer. There were all of these really big promises. I remember this very, very well. And I, I remember I didn't think it was too good to be true. I thought, I thought, well, finally, a good story. That was all yeah. I thought about it at the time. Yeah. And so Monsanto did what companies do is they invited me into their headquarters and they spent a lot of time uh, trying to teach me the way to write about their company and to write about their products. Uh, Dow and DuPont did the same thing, Syngenta, all of these big companies, because I was working for such a big and influential news agency, they spent a lot of time wooing me and trying to make sure that I understood uh, the business from their perspective and, and the hope that I would write about it from their perspective. But I also did what good journalists do. I, you know, I developed other sources and I spent a lot of time with scientists, with farmers, with, with weed scientists, with some people who worked in the regulatory regime, uh, academics, professors, people who you know, came from a different perspective to understand this. And I learned and came to understand over the years that I covered this, that there was a dark side, uh, if you will, or there were things that the companies had been hiding and there were very real risks that were coming along with the rewards. That and these about where are we now uh, in, ti in timeline? So early 2000s, okay. I suppose, um, you know, early 2000s and okay. then mid and then late and, you know, and I, particularly with this chemical glyphosate that Monsanto was pushing Roundup, based on this chemical glyphosate. Glyphosate became the most widely used weed killing agent in the world. Thank you, thanks to Monsanto. It became ubiquitous in our environment because Monsanto pushed it to such widespread use. Uh, government scientists were finding it in water, in air samples, even in rainfall. It uh, was found you know, in food samples. We were, Monsanto kept going back to the government asking for increased allowances to have residues of its weed killer in food. Um, so, you know, as the science built and I was writing about the science and about the concerns and growing evidence that this chemical could be linked to cancer and, and other health problems, as well as a whole array of environmental problems, Monsanto decided that, you know, I was, I was somebody they needed to shut up and shut down. And they started, they stopped wooing me and they started trying to harass me, intimidate me. Uh, I mean, there's, we can get into it. There have been a whole array of tactics that they've deployed to try to take me down, I guess, um, tried to interfere could, with my work. If you could share, share what, what, one or two, no, I, I'm interested. <laughs> Well, there's so many. I mean, when I, I was at, when I was at Reuters, you know, they spent quite a lot of time uh, trying to harass me, my editors, trying to, um, you know, just really influence the coverage and get me or get my editors to stop allowing stories about the scientific studies, for instance, that showed harm with their products. Um, and so that was one thing. 
when I left Reuters and I wrote my first book um, that sort of exposed a lot of the deceptive tactics that the company had engaged in and a lot of the collusion with regulators that I was able to uncover uh, by gathering data and documents. Uh, they developed a whole internal strategic plan to discredit the book and that involved you know, we got copies uh, through litigation, copies of their internal documents against me and showed that they were going to manipulate search engine optimization so that, for instance, if people went on Google and Googled my name and glyphosate, for instance, they would then be directed automatically to web links that Monsanto wanted them to see. Wow. Uh, and they talked about how they were going to do that. They talked about how to get negative book reviews posted. Um, about my book that looked like they didn't come from Monsanto, that looked like they came from, you know, just third party, regular folk. Uh, and they had it in writing. They had it in writing. They had a spreadsheet. You know, it was a pretty long list of tasks. Um, it was called the Kerry Gillum book plan. <laughs> wow. If that's not a sign you're effective, I don't know what is. So, you know, um, We've uncovered, I've uncovered, you know, and others have uncovered a lot um, of similar tactics that they've employed to, to silence anybody really that is pointing to, you know, harm or risk or red flags with their products. Uh, we also have evidence um, that they've paid a lot of money to front groups, to organizations that again, look like they're independent, look like they're maybe science organizations or consumer organizations, and they have paid money to these groups. And then these organizations, there's one called the American Council on Science and Health, for instance. Uh -huh. uh, and that group, if you go on their website and you put in Carrie Gillum, you'll see that they have written just a slew of articles about me and you know said that just terrible things about me really um, that aren't true but our internal emails that we've been able to get uh, show that Monsanto was paying them money and talking about how you won't get a better value for your dollar than ACSH um, you know this sort of thing so it's and really in America um, excuse me in America these are not illegal it is not yes. illegal for organizations to pay a front group to pretend it's a real grassroots group. Uh, it's an, it, it's uh, all too common. However, to be discovered is very embarrassing. And yeah. obviously they were discovered. We're here talking about it now. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I've been able to get a lot of documents. I've gotten thousands of pages, actually, that I you know used to write my two books. But from filing Freedom of Information Act requests. I um, have sued the EPA twice actually to get documents and, and the FDA uh, one time, but have gotten a lot of internal documents showing communications back and forth between the regulators, which are really alarming because they really show a loyalty to the company, mm -hmm. not really to public health. But we also have then thousands of documents through this litigation uh, that are directly just Monsanto internal records talking amongst themselves about all of these really deceptive plans to, to deceive consumers and farmers and lawmakers. And uh, there's one federal judge involved in this roundup litigation who has commented more than once, and he did again just recently, that all of this evidence shows that Monsanto really didn't care about public health. Uh, they cared about protecting their product, but not about protecting the public. So what did, what do you, when did you feel that you had made huge progress or, or won? Can you tell us, tell us about that? Oh gosh. I, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's funny because when my first book came out, Whitewash in 2017, uh, the Roundup litigation, these are cancer patients that have sued Monsanto, uh, alleging that exposure to Roundup caused them to develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and several people have died, but there are over 100,000 people now that have sued the company because the evidence really that this causes cancer and that the company covered it up, the evidence is just overwhelming. And there have been three trials, all three trials, the juries have voted unanimously in favor of the plaintiffs and they've awarded huge amounts of money. So, you know, it's really not a doubt any longer. And my first book came out though before any of the trials and there were a lot of people who were skeptical. I remember reporters, other reporters at other organizations, you know, doubting me and 
being very skeptical. And now these same people will come to me and say, man, wow, like you were right. You got, how do you feel? Do you feel? And I said, well, I always knew I was right. I mean, this, that was really never a question. I mean, the data is not disputable. Um, but Bayer, so Bayer bought Monsanto, you know, the giant German phar pharmaceutical. And in late July, uh, they said they were gonna pull Roundup from the market. They Late to, July of this year. July of 2021, they said they are not going to sell it to US consumers anymore. Now they're gonna continue to sell it to farmers and commercial applicators. But you know, that to a degree, um, I did get a lot of emails from people thanking me, you know, saying all of your work exposing all of this, you know, contributed to this move. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I do think it's important. All of my work as a journalist, it's not about a commercial outcome. My, my work as a journalist is about bringing information to light, truthful information that's important for public health, public policy, that people have a right to know because it affects all of us, affects our health. I mean, that's my job. That's the job as a journalist. So that's what I've done. And um, hopefully it has made a difference. I don't, I guess I don't know for sure, but I hope it has. Well, I am so very impressed because it, it sounds to me that the work you did, it was never about you or about your career. It was always about what you were doing. That's how it sounds to me. And it looks like the dog got out. Uh, if I'm going to pause for a second. Okay. <laughs> my husband let the dog out. Darn husband. Pause. Darn that, dog. That's him banging on the door. I'm going to pause. And I am so very grateful for what you've done because um, I can tell, I can, t I can see, I've already read that they, they tried to go after you when they realized they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, talk about the data because they were wrong. They went after you. And that's a classic sign that you know you're on the right track, but you hung in there because it sounds like that harassment must have been pretty awful. Um, it, I'd love to um, talk just for a moment about something I read on page 50 of your book which is pretty shocking to me. On page 50, it talks about how um, the, uh, the Miller firm, that was the firm that was representing um, Mr. Lee, uh, who had uh, non-Hodgkin's um, lymphoma, and they met with Monsanto's lawyers. And at the time, Monsanto seemed totally unconcerned. Monsanto seemed like, like they were untouchable, okay? And then uh, as soon as the Miller firm got a hold of some emails, apparently a, a Monsanto, um, apparently, excuse me, I'm starting, with, we starting Jess. Apparently an expert named James Perry had, had gone to Monsanto and was concerned because the company's products appeared to be dangerous. And in an email, a Monsanto toxo toxicologist, William Haydens wrote, wrote, um, we are not going to do the studies that this expert suggests we do. In fact, instead, we're going to focus on seeking out a different expert who could be influential with regulators. And this is in writing, right? <laughs> in an email. So uh, and what the reason I find this interesting is and this is I'd like to bring some encouragement to our listeners by telling them that doing stuff like this is not uncommon. It's a, these huge corporations with tons of money and tons of power do stuff like this all the time. They some, somehow they rise to a level of thinking nobody can touch them and that and that they that nobody can stop them. Uh, did, can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean that Perry um, incident that you've described there. Yeah, I mean that's exactly it. And that actually, when you look at the totality of the evidence, in my mind anyway, that's you know, well, I was kind of middle of the road. I mean, in terms of uh, the wrongdoing or the misconduct that you see, you know, yeah, Perry was an expert. Monsanto brought him in uh, because there were a lot of outside independent scientific uh, research papers being published showing problems, genotoxicity concerns with, with Monsanto's herbicide. And they brought Perry in and Perry kind of agreed. And he said, yeah, you know, it looks like there's genotoxicity issues and you should probably do more studies. Uh, to make sure your product isn't causing cancer. And Monsanto basically, as you, as you wrote or said there, said, yeah, no, <laughs> that's not our interest. Our interest is in somebody who's going to help us. Uh, we'll with, just get another with, expert. 
Oh, and one with influence with the regulators. Yeah. And it's, it's in writing. And yeah. um, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I also stood up against a big guy. That was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, it, I found emails, things put in writing that are absolutely shocking. And I think these large corporations, they seem so unbeatable, but they are beatable because they do things like we've just described. They, they put things in writing that are damning, right. incredibly damning. Yeah, I mean, that's really, unfortunately, uh, and I was just talking to somebody about this today and there's more evidence that's come out uh, here. Uh, we've recently had four whistleblowers from the EPA come out and essentially say, you know, there's scientists who work in the EPA and they are providing evidence. They provide internal emails, you know, again, from these are from the EPA, but they are talking about how these big companies, you know, and this would be like a Monsanto, a Bear, a Dow, a DuPont, these big companies want their chemicals approved. And you scientists who are finding problems with them, you better shut up. And, you know, and these scientists have reported that when they find a cancer risk or a developmental risk, neurotoxicity, their managers in the EPA are saying, no, the companies want these approved and they want them approved really fast. And they've sometimes they override these scientists and they delete language about the risks and they, and they help the companies hide the risks. These are the EPA officials. So, you know, right now, when we're, you and I are speaking here in August of 2021, uh, these whistleblowers from the EPA have asked Congress to investigate uh, the Office of Inspector General, you know, they are trying to blow the whistle, if you will. And they're saying that this wasn't just part of past administrations, it's the Biden administration as well, mm -hmm. that uh, is pushing this loyalty to companies over loyalty to, to public health. So it's a really, really big and really important issue. I think you raise a good point, Carrie, that these problems are not uh, uh, administration to administration specific. They are not. Uh, these problems go on for decades. Uh, it'd be nice to think an administration could clean everything up. Uh, and that's a subject of another book. I've got another one right here, Why yeah. Presidents Fail. But, um, but yeah, you can't just depend on a new, a new administration to just fix everything, even though they try. Uh, I, I wanted to touch for just a moment on, you talked about Freedom of Information Act and, and the value of a Freedom of Information Act and how uh, in certain situations, you had to, even though it's the law that they're supposed to comply, you had to actually threaten them with lawsuit. Could you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. The Freedom of Information Act um, is over 50 years old. It's a law that is designed to essentially, you know, ensure democracy and ensure the citizens' right to transparency with the way our government acts on our behalf. You know, they're spending our tax dollars and they're supposed to be representing and protecting our interests. So this FOIA, as we call it, is, is the tool that anyone can use to make a request to a federal agency. There are also state record requests that, you know, an institution, any public institution that relies on tax dollars, you have the right to go to them and ask for documents, records, information, and they are legally- Anybody, anybody. Any, anyone, anybody. right. Uh, and they are supposed to turn it over. Now, of course, there are different exemptions and provisions and, um, you know, loopholes, if you will, but it really is probably the very best tool you have to, to get real information, to get an inside look at what the agencies are doing. But, you know, they do oftentimes make it really hard for you to get the information. And, and then, what, then what do you do? Well, then you sue them, <laughs> uh, which is what I've done. And, you know, I, I recently just did one at a state university and, you know, they, they're exorbitant costs associated with it. They, you know, want several hundreds and hundreds of dollars for just a few pages of records. And, um, and then they blank out a lot of information when you finally do get the records. I mean, they do make it difficult, but, you know, if you're devoted to it and dedicated and you have the time and the energy and the resources, you know, that is, that is a tool and it's a tool journalists use all the time. It's a great tool. And I'd like to um, elaborate just for a moment that 
the, the freedom of information, a request under the FOIA is free. And usually they don't charge you money. Uh, it, usually they don't. But if they do, and you are a community member just trying to, 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 to sound the horn, you can just tell everybody, look, this, this organization, this university or whatever it is, is charging me money you know, for, for, for information that we have a right to have. And then that will enrage and, and that will uh, and spur more people to get involved. And that might, sometimes that's just enough to, uh, to get the organization to back down and say, here, here you go, here's your information. Uh, it's, it's a delay tactic. I right. feel and, strongly, and I, it's a delay tactic. Yeah, and I should point out, you're right. I mean, most of the federal agencies um, don't charge exorbitant fees. A lot of the state institutions do, but um, and even when you sue, I mean, if you follow the procedures and you do it correctly, filing a lawsuit isn't that big of a deal, actually, because the, they're going to find in your favor and then the EPA or whoever it is pays the legal costs associated with that. And it's just sort of the standard way that it that it has happened, at least in my experience. It, uh, it's, again, a delay tactic. It slowed you down a little bit. But in the end, you got your information. Uh, and, and I can elaborate just a tiny little bit on that. That happened to me twice. Uh, I uh, applied for information uh, under the FOIA with the Army Corps of Engineers. And six months later, they still had not given me a single word. So what I did is I threatened lawsuit. I, I didn't file, I threatened it. And I said, if I don't have at least a partial fulfillment, and this was Christmas Eve, <laughs> I said, by New Year's Eve, I will be filing lawsuit. And then, and then, and sure enough, the following Monday, I got a pack of data this thick <laughs> that was a part of the data. And all I had to do was threaten. And, and the bottom line is, uh, not every time, but the bottom line is, it's a delay tactic. They'll try anything. Uh, but the number one uh, trick of the big guys is delay, stall, uh, non-answer, non-reply, and just don't let them do it. And, and you'd be surprised how much you, one person, has uh, with this uh, wonderful law that's 50 years old that, that any person in the country uh, is free to, uh, free to use. And, and uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, I found it so interesting that in the beginning, before Monsanto saw you as a threat, they tried to be your buddy and invited you in um, to their offices and you know, tried to help you see their point of view. It sounded like they started out trying to be your friend. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty common, you know, in the banking industry, any of the industries I've ever covered, healthcare, banking, insurance, and, and the ag chem industry, and they do it with very large publications, Wall Street Journal, you know, New York Times, um, Bloomberg, Reuters, uh, Dow, if you're a large news organization, and you have, there's influence in the stories that you write, uh, of course, they're going to want to uh, to woo you and to be your buddy and to be your friend. And there's a lot of that that goes on. And it's, I don't know that that's, um, unethical. you know, I think that's just sort of the nature of the beast, but you know, any good journalist is going to learn everything that they can. Right. But then also go to other sources and, and try to have a balanced and, and honest approach to the stories that they write. Right. And then you became effective and then they shut down and then the, uh, and what you very well described, the harassment campaign began. And, and on that note, is there any word of encouragement you can give, you know, the, the, the would-be uh, community organizer out there that's thinking of standing up to the big guys, any word of encouragement you can give them for when that potential um, harassment campaign comes along? I think I would say, you know, I, I've been affected, obviously. I've, you know, there have been times when I've been I don't know, afraid, I guess. Is that the right way? I've had some fear um, and been upset with the things I see written about me online. But I think you just, you keep your head down, you shut out the noise and you stay true to your task and whatever that is. And you arm yourself with data, you know, facts, data. It can't be hyperbole. It can't be emotional. It has to be real, you know, and take the facts to the people who need to know them and need to see them. And, you know, there are very real risks with these chemicals that I write about and these pesticides and things that are used every day and these companies that are pushing them ever more present into our lives. 
And unfortunately, our regulators are not doing a lot to protect us. So it's up to the people to do that. Um, but there's plenty of information. You just you got to stick to it and you got to be for, you know, not afraid to make people mad, I guess. <laughs> not afraid. Not afraid. That is very, very, very encouraging. And I, I hope all of you um, heard every word because I, I couldn't agree more with everything that you've just said. It, and, and the only thing I can add is, is you knew in your heart you were right. You knew you were right. You knew you were onto something and you stuck with it. Uh, and you could even see the people who are being affected by this, that the people affected by this, uh, by the roundup, it's, it's heartbreaking to listen to their health, health effects they're having. It's really ha having an effect on me. So thank you for sticking with it. Uh, thank you for all of the, the work that you've done. Thank you for the words of encouragement and advice that you've given to uh, all of our listeners today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the work you're doing. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm, I'm just getting started. Um, but, uh, but thank you so much. And thank you again, Carrie, for joining me. I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording. Great. Yeah. You're good at that. Well, I think.